Well, good day, folks, and welcome to another edition of Lumberjack Logic. Excited to have my very own state senator, uh, Senator Tomasoni, on today. And so um, I, I want to talk about some things specific to the Iron Range and just some of the issues in uh, pending legislation. But uh, also, uh, Senator Tomasoni, you had uh, been a member of the Democrat Party for for forever. I mean, I, for life. I mean, as long as your political life and you switched to independent this past year, do you want to just tell us briefly about that and maybe why you did that? And well, I didn't leave the party, but I, but, but what Senator Bach and I did was we did uh, form an independent caucus within the, within the legislative framework itself. So, so we are um, not caucusing with the DFL and we're not caucusing with the Republicans, but we're independent. And then we, uh, we work uh, closely with the majority party because um, we had a, an opportunity to potentially make a difference in this legislative session by being chairs of committees and, and being part of the solution. And uh, had we stayed in the minority caucus, uh, we would have been uh, basically uh, not part of the solution because when you are doing a budget session like we are this time around in, yeah. uh, in the uh, odd number year of the legislative session and we're deciding the budget for the next two years, the minority doesn't really have a lot to say. And so it made all the sense in the world for us to make this move and to be able to represent our constituents way better by doing this. And so I'm, uh, I'm, com I'm comfortable with what, 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 what we did here. Yeah, well, good deal. And I know I've been meeting with a lot of uh, people down here in St. Paul uh, in person. And, you know, I've met with a number of Republicans uh, from the state house, and I know they are in the minority, and it is a, it's a great frustration for them. So it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting situation. In fact, uh, if I go back to the beginning of my career, in, uh, I, I got elected to the House in 1992. And so for the first six years of the of my career in the in the legislature, we were in the majority. Uh, DFL was in the majority. In fact, they had been in the majority since 1986, and basically the Senate was in the uh, Democratic hands also. And so, uh, it, the the only the only thing between them and doing everything they wanted to do was uh, Arnie Carlson was the governor in 1992. Uh, but the funny part was that. Uh, that even though the Democrats were in control of both the House and the Senate, they still fought with each other, which was. <laughs> <laughs> there seems to be, I'm, I'm discovering that there seems to be no end to political fighting uh, anywhere. It's, uh, and yeah. I think it's only gotten worse. Uh, uh, yeah, and, 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 it, and, the, and the funnier thing that happened was that uh, in 1998, the Republicans took control of the House. And, and so I, I remember being in our, in our, now we're in our minority caucus. Yeah. And uh, somebody is saying, all right, when we go out there, we're going to do this. And then somebody else would say, uh, we're not in the majority anymore. We can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> we got these bold initiatives and we're going to do this. And, and I imagine, you know, at that point, as I'm seeing a lot of uh, legislators on the Republican side are taking heat from their constituents. Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Uh, obviously, they can't. I mean, they can only advance what they can advance and find some common ground on. Uh, but to that end, uh, you probably went through some of that as well with your constituents. Absolutely. And, uh, but I, I'm getting really, really good feedback, just so you know, about, about uh, making a decision that took a, took it. Well, it was, I agonized over it. It was, it was really, really hard to, to, to do because it was so close to the election and uh, people voted for me as a Democrat. And, yeah. and I, I wanted to take more time to think about it, but uh, the issue was that when you get uh, done with an election and then, and then there's a, uh, a forming of the legislature, you have to make decisions right away. And so we either, we either had to do it or we didn't do it. And, and we thought it was, was, was best to do it. There were some people who were upset and I, I, I basically talked, I actually called the people who were upset and talked to them and I think they understood and we gave me another chance and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a real lot of people are calling up and saying, you know, that took guts, and I, I, I admire that you're standing up for your area of the state. So, so we got some really good feedback on it. Well, and speaking to members of both parties, uh, myself, I mean, you're you're definitely a respected member of the Senate, uh, and on on both sides of the aisle. So, um, anyhow, that's uh, well, for what and, it's worth. And, and you know, the potential is that we become a little bit of a bridge between the over the you know the partisan divide and. And hopefully, if there's a couple of issues that we can you know make make a difference on, that that we'll be able to do it. 
So now what, 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 what do you think, what do you see as potentially the issues where there is the chance for agreement? Uh, what are some of the issues where you think maybe you can cross that divide? Well, I, I think for right now, it's a matter of um, going into this budgeting session and, and all or nothing initiatives on, on both sides that uh, maybe, maybe we come to become the voice of, of, uh, of reason and say, hey, you know what? There's nothing wrong with meeting in the middle on this and, uh, and, and figuring this out because we are going to have a, uh, well, the governor came out with a, with a very, very robust budget, uh, raising taxes in several different places and, and putting, and putting uh, uh, more money into, into certain parts of the budget, which, you know, is, is his prerogative. And the, and the Senate Republicans have definitely said, you know, we're not raising taxes. We're not, you know, and we're, and we're not going to be doing what the governor wants to do. So somewhere in the middle, there has to be some some kind of a compromise, and it doesn't necessarily mean we have to raise tax ta taxes, but it, but it could mean that um, uh, the governor gets some of his uh, funding increases without raising taxes because the Republicans decide to do something within the budget parameters that that might work. And so so we I think we could be uh, uh, in in the middle of something like that. Well, you know, one thing that's really important to obviously us in northern Minnesota and really to everybody in the state is infrastructure. And so when you look at our roads, bridges, those types of things, uh, those, I mean, I live just off Highway 73, State Highway 73, which was horrendous, but 65 was even worse over by Goodland. I mean, I just avoided that road like the plague. I mean, it was just, I mean, it was unbelievable. They finally did a mill and fill on that now, not this past year, but the year before. It's much better, but all it was was a mill and fill when that road bed on 65 probably needed to be rebuilt. Um, and so infrastructure spending, I think, is something that, that people can kind of get behind. But one of the things that I'm hearing, uh, I guess, from people out there, and I've talked to some people who work at MnDOT, and I said, you know, how come it is we can't get more progression on these roads and get, you know, better roads? I mean, there's, it's a big budget. Um, and, you know, and I, that, and I was talking to some plow truck drivers and they said, well, if you saw how much administration there was per plow truck driver, maybe you'd begin to understand. So the question is, is there some cuts we can make in MnDOT that are from less effective areas that can be applied to roads? Uh, that's, I think, a real question that people have. You know, I think, I think the real issue with MnDOT is that, that, that all the roads in the state need, 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 need work. And, and it's, it's a constant um, battle year after year after year. And so what you just said about Highway 65 and what, and what they did on Highway 73, they're kind of band-aids that last for four or five years. And, and, and then they have to go do them over again. But they, they, uh, they, 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 they somehow come to the conclusion that it, if we can just get these things done in a short period of time for not very much money uh, and, and use the bulk of the money for the great big projects, the, the bridge repairs and the, mm -hmm. and the 35Es and, or the 35s and the 94s and, and the big projects that they have, um, I think they've come to the conclusion that's better. For us in rural Minnesota, um, you know, going between Hibbing and Virginia, it, it, there's a few spots that you see, it, it's like you're on rumble strips because oh, yeah. the, the rumble strips are, so, are so bad. And they're, like, they're in exactly the same spot every year. But we have two stretches of highway that I've been trying to get MnDOT to understand what what wonderful work they did here, and they were both. Uh, one is just before Chisholm, and then and then one is just uh, just south of Chisholm, and uh, by Ironworld, and um, and there was subsidence issues there from underground mining, and so, so what they did was they 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 actually what they call the land bridge where they put massive amounts of rebar in this in the concrete and I think they made it 12 inches thick and then they did one continuous pour and it was very expensive but the, that that section of highway has no frost heaps on it and it has no degradation and it's been there for like 10 years and it's like maybe just maybe spend a little bit more money on these highways and maybe we'll get our money back in return for not having to repair them year after year. After. Yeah, it'd be great to see an analysis of that because you're right. That stretch of road is wonderful. I drive it yep. all the time. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, um, so those are, you know, I, I'm just trying to think, okay, well, where is it like, you know, the compromise. So, you know, you look at the old vehicle place where, you know, you're paying $35 for tabs and people say, well, that needs to be modernized and updated because vehicles are lasting longer. And I think actually that the, the public could say, 
well, okay, we can, we can give that, but can you find some efficiencies in MnDOT where you can maybe put more to the roads just out of that? Can we get kind of a combined effort and come up with, uh, you know, maybe a couple hundred million dollars or something that way? Potentially, you could look at, at that, but I doubt you would find it within the agency itself. You know, you might, you might be able to find, uh, you know, a, a couple million here and a couple million there. And so the, so the, so the, 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 the issue becomes how much do you need? Now they tell us that we need 600 million a year for the next 10 years. And, um, and so that's a, that's a big number. And, and, you know, the issue, the issue with the gas tax is now we're going to electric cars. And so, so what happens to the gas tax for, and so then you know, what we did in the legislature was we, we, uh, we used the sales tax on, um, on automotive uh, sales in, in, in repair stores and you know, like, you know, the, the, uh, the various places where you go to buy automotive parts and use that sales tax to go for repair. And that seems to have been uh, pretty successful. And then and now we're doing using bonding money also. So uh, we, got, we got to get a little bit creative, I think, when it comes to our highways. And that, that's, that's for sure. So. Yeah, because it is the one issue. I mean, I, if, there, if you want to look for one unity issue in Minnesota, roads are it. I mean, this well, is... that's, that, that is true. But, you know, we have more lane miles out in rural Minnesota. But down in down in the cities, they have they have way more cars, you know, and, they have, yeah. and so and so the you know the where, where where the necessities are is interesting. I mean, I just talked about 169 be, between Hibbing and Virginia. Well, that highway was supposed to be complete between uh, between uh, Virginia and and Grand Rapids. It was supposed to be a four lane highway in 1967, and so oh, wow. <laughs> that's when it was, that's <laughs> when it was supposed that. to be completed. And so it goes as far as Penn Gilly, and then and then the four lane gets picked yeah. up between the scenic highway and goes and goes over to Grand Rapids. So so there's about four. I think it's about 14 miles in between. We're still working at. So so we got this corridor as a commerce program that 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 has that has put some money into that particular program. Uh, we, and so hopefully we can get some more money into that in, in the very near future and get that. Yeah. Like that. Highway two is another big one between, you know, like around that Swan river, that's always just a, a bad stretch of road. Yeah. So, uh, and, and, and we have logging trucks, you know, and we have, we have, yes. we, have we have vehicles that go on them that, uh, that maybe are a little bit harder on the highway than some other places. So, so, you know, our, our natural resource based economy is one of the kind of things that you have to actually make, you have to make, make you have, to, you have to figure out how to how to utilize it to, to the best of your advantage. And yeah. that's we need to spend a little bit more. Well, I know you've got another committee meeting up, so I'm not gonna hold you up any longer. I'd, uh, I'd love to talk some more things about Northern Minnesota. I mean, there's there's mining, there's there's a whole host of issues up in our area. And you know, let, me, let me just say, you know, we, because because mining is a huge issue in our area, and, and I, I'm gonna put a, a little plug in for it because, you know, we've been mining Iron ore since uh, since the 1880s, yes. and and, uh, and John D. Rockefeller actually said that it, but but for the Masabi Iron Range, you know we'd be speaking German now. And um, and and the fact of the matter is that you give, you give the Masabi Iron Range credit for for winning World War II because the ore went into the tanks and the ships and the, yes. whatever else you have the airplanes and so um, we, we've been a part of been, been a part of this nation's history for a long long time. And now we're going into a new age economy, and the new age economy is requiring things like copper and cobalt and uh, palladium and platinum, all these different uh, metals. And we have all these metals in northeastern Minnesota. And not only have we proven that we can mine, we've proven that we can mine safely and environmentally soundly. And we can provide really, really good jobs that provide middle class families a good income and a, and a good living. And um, when you look at a windmill, windmill has something like 220 tons of steel in it and another nine and a half tons of copper and so if you want to have a new age economy you have to mine and i would much rather mine in northeastern minnesota where we have incidentally we have the only clean water in the state and that's not just me saying it that came from the environmental quality board's report card on water in the state of minnesota and so in a place where we've been mining for 140 years and have the only clean water in the state it's proof we know what we're doing and we know how to do it. And so we can do this uh, precious metals mining and we can do it in a safe way and we can do it in a safe way. And in fact, the environmental impact statement by the, by the DNR said that uh, polymet will have no hazard runoff. And so the fact of the matter is we've gone through the process, we've gone through the laws, we've done whatever we had to do in order to uh, make this uh, a 
proven process and and all the permits have been issued and now now we're going through the courts with the environmentalist lawsuits and i think a lot of them are trivial lawsuits and somewhere along the way we got to get this project started because we're going to prove that we can do this right too well i would uh i would love to actually have a further conversation on that at some point in the in the future uh because it's uh it, it involves so much because it involves our economies up there also it's our it's our tourism it's it's a whole host of things and uh and then you're also bringing up windmills and, and energy and, and that's that's such a deep subject but i uh um not to, not to mention we have the only solar panel manufacturing plant in the state in in, in, in mountain air so, so yes. we're doing our part in, in, in for the north. i actually live off grid i don't you know it's uh i live south of uh, south of hibbing and my driveway's over a mile long it was it was cheaper to build an off-grid system than to bring in wire and yeah. uh and I believe that. That's interesting. I got to stop and see you someday. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's it's really it's wonderful. It's a great setup, and we we are never we have a dishwasher, we have a washer dryer, we have it all, and we run it all off that solar. And uh, in the winter, you actually produce more power than you do in the summer when the sun's shining. It's just there's not enough hours of daylight, but because it's so cold, it conducts the electricity better. We don't have the air currents from China, and so the sky is actually clearer, and you have the reflective power of the snow. So all three of those add up and I get more than the rated watts of my panels out of my panels. That's great. That's great. So, okay. I got to leave. <laughs> all right. Sounds okay. good. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Take care. Yep.